Welcome to Doc Talk here on the MedicalTVChannel.com. I'm your host, Michael Ray. It's your opportunity to talk with a doctor. Any questions or concerns you might have, you can send them through us right here on the, the uh, MedicalTVChannel.com website. Two opportunities there on your screen. You can either use the live chat or you can use old school email. Either way, you can pass questions to us and we can go ahead and pass them on to a doctor. Today, we're talking to Dr. William P. Adams. He's an associate clinical professor of plastic surgery at UT South. Southwestern in Dallas. He also has his own private practice in the University Park area. Doctor, thanks for taking some time today. How long have you been doing this? How'd you get to become such a celebrated plastic surgeon? Well, that's very kind of you, Michael. I actually have uh, been here in, in Dallas for over 20 years. I, I did my university training at Prince University, and then I went to Vanderbilt University for medical school and I came to Dallas to do my general surgery and, and plastic surgery training and then went into practice in 1997 and, and was uh, at UT Southwestern Medical Center full-time and now uh, transitioned to part-time at the university and in my private practice which is based in University Park. Let's uh, get right to it. A, a lot of different things that you've uh, no doubt seen change over the years in the years that you just mentioned. What's what's different? Are there myths that people think uh, are the way things are and they truly are not that they have changed in, in your field? Absolutely. You know, when back when uh, when I was growing up, I think plastic surgery was really felt to be the realm of the movie stars and and, as, and, and if people did have plastic surgery, they didn't want to talk about it, you know, and that's totally changed in that plastic surgery has become much more mainstream. People of all, uh, all classes have uh, uh, gotten to accept plastic surgery much more, and it's just uh, become a very, very popular thing from, from both non-surgical and surgical uh, aspects. Let's talk about some changes in, in just how invasive it is, and I know a lot of the surgery you do is, uh, say, breast augmentation. If somebody were to choose that procedure, is that where you have to kind of take vacation time, plan out a couple of weeks away from work to, to lay on the couch in recovery, or where's that at right now? Yes, you know, what we found with, with really advances in breast augmentation has really revolutionized the whole experience of the patient. So. Many patients experience uh, a recovery for breast augmentation that can be one or two weeks where they can't raise their arms above their head. But what we found with, with many of the outcome studies that we've done is that, that you can really have a very fast, quick, easy recovery with breast augmentation. So using these techniques now, our patients typically are out shopping the day of surgery, out to eat dinner the night of surgery. Uh, and really with minimal pain and discomfort and back to their, their jobs within one to two days. It really is an amazing time. Here we are chatting back and forth with you on the web. I want to remind folks who are watching us on MedicalTVChannel.com, it's a chance for you to forward us uh, questions via email or there on the uh, screen. You can see the live chat box. Uh, doctor, um, as far as the changes go, Folks like to find out information on the web these days. I'm sure you well know that. Do you see people researching a procedure before they even come to talk to you about it? Do they already come with a certain amount of knowledge and how much of that is accurate? Absolutely, it's, it's incredible how much information is on the internet and patients really have, have embraced that and, and so much to the fact that unfortunately with the vast breadth of knowledge on the internet, a lot of that sometimes is misinformation. So for patients, the key is trying to get a source that's, that's credible and that they can trust. Uh, and we see that a lot in our practice. As a matter of fact, I have one, pay, uh, one of my staff members is a dedicated patient educator, and she spends a lot of time talking to patients and educating them about the procedure. But what we find is that a lot of times patients have have found out a lot of information, but some of that information may not be totally accurate. So we spend time trying to determine what the patients know and then uh, redirect them if necessary so they really can know as much as they possibly can about any given procedure. Speaking of which, there must be several procedures available uh, to the patients these days. What other things do you do? What other, other advances have you, have you seen? Well, you know, there's, there really, plastic surgery has really exploded in the past five to ten years as far as hot topics and different advances. And, you know, you can look at, we've already talked about some things in breast augmentation, but if you look at body contouring, 
uh, advances in, in liposuction. There's a lot of new technology as far as uh, fat removal, non-surgical fat removal, um, even the talk of, of uh, potential lasers removing fat. Uh, there's been incredible advances also in just non-surgical things. You know, as you know, Michael, the most popular thing that that's done in plastic surgery is is Botox and soft tissue fillers. And there's been an incredible advance, uh, particularly in the United States, of of having new fillers and new uh, um, botulinum toxins that are that patients are really able to benefit from. Let me ask you about that too, because uh, obviously you, you know much more about it. I think even if you follow things like this in the news, you, there's still a lot of misinformation about. It. You just mentioned two things: uh, Botox. Has that changed from when it originally came out? Is it the same procedure, or I would imagine there are some advances there as well? Yes, yeah, so, you know. Um, Botox or, or botulinum toxin, as, as it's called, is it's not. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really a, a toxin per se, but it's a compound that has been used since actually the late '80s in uh, various aspects of medicine. It was originally used in patients who had uh, um, an issue with their eyeball movement, uh, strabismus, it's called, and, and also patients in their vocal cords, and then. In the early to mid 90s, it really started to gain some acceptance in the cosmetic surgery uh, application. So, um, as you know, patients uh, may have lines such as uh, their forehead or around their eyes or in between their eyes that make them look like they're frowning. And what Botox can do is it can actually relax that muscle to smooth that wrinkle and, and truly give the patient a rejuvenated look. And so, um, you know, Botox has been, uh, there's, there's different types, but basically um, there's been one particular uh, manufacturer has had almost a monopoly on Botox market for many years, but now there's actually some new ones that are coming in uh, uh, to the marketplace, and the techniques for injection have also been uh, advanced as well. So. Overall, it's, it, it is an exciting area, and as I say, it's very, very popular. Uh, one of the most common things that, that plastic surgeons do. When we went over this category, you mentioned it, not only Botox, but fillers. Is, is a filler a type of Botox? Are they two different things? What, what is uh, the advancement there? Yeah, that's a great question. So soft tissue fillers are actually different from Botox. Um, what we know as, as people age, uh, you know, if I look at myself as when I was 15 years old compared to now, you notice your face loses volume. And so one of the one of the key aspects of rejuvenation is actually to restore volume. And so that's what soft tissue fillers are. There's different types, but they all have the same theme and that we're trying to restore volume to the face in areas that people lose it. So typically, uh, you'll see patients that have may have lines in their nasolabial fold or in their cheeks or their lips and as they are seeing some of the aging process start they can see some of the those areas lose volume and it can it, that can manifest as a crease um, so a crease in the cheek as in the nasally fold that gets deeper as somebody gets older or their lips uh, tend to be a little bit thinner and they want to have fuller, fuller lips so the fillers that we use are able to to restore volume in that area and, and again and just gives a, a patient a rejuvenated look. But the nice thing about that is it's a non-surgical thing. It's done in the office. There's minimal recovery and uh, tolerated very, very well with very minimal pain uh, to, to, to use those products. So they've been definitely a big advance and something that patients really like. We want to remind our viewers once again here on MedicalTVChannel.com, we want you to be part of the conversation. There on the web page, you can see a chat box over to the left. You can type your question in there. Or if you want to do it uh, old school, if you will, you can also do email there on the page. Let's go to the chat box. Doctor, there's an interesting question here, um, and it's kind of a technical question. What do you think about uh, the transfer of, um, uh, the, about fat transfer in breast augmentation? What, what, number one, for those of us who don't know, what, what are they talking about there, and, and what do you think about it? So fat transfer is basically taking fat from one area of the body and then placing it into another area. And it's something that, that we've done in plastic surgery for many years for uh, various different applications, but typically in, in reconstructive type procedures where there's 
say a soft tissue deficit or a, a contour irregularity that you can take fat from one area and inject that into another area and usually you have about 50 percent of that fat that will survive long term so it's a technique that we've used uh, successfully uh, for many years now the it, the, the story gets a little bit more controversial when you start talking about uh, injecting fat into the breast and, and, and we'll talk more in terms of cosmetic breast surgery right now but for say breast augmentation um, it, it's, not, it's much less proven right now what the actual number one efficacy or success of injecting fat in the breast and then probably more importantly for the patient what the actual safety of injecting fat into the breast is. And so it's really an evolving area. I ch chair the Hot Topics Forum uh, for our societies and, and every year you know, we have some presentations on that. And, and right now it's, it's really what I would just term an evolving uh, subject. So it's not something that I certainly would recommend to any patients until we have more scientific data to say that this is a viable option for a breast augmentation patient and it's something that's safe and is not going to um, cause interference with the detection of a breast cancer or have other issues. Um, but I think in the next, you know, three to five years, we'll have more and more scientific data and we'll be able to advise uh, patients accordingly regarding that, that particular modality of treatment. I want to circle back to that in just a moment. I like the fact that you're uh, talking about hot topics. We'll get to that. But right now, we do have the viewer questions here via the chat box. Here's another one, and it, it's about what we talked about earlier in the program. 24-hour recovery from breast augmentation. Is this common? Do all plastic surgeons do this? Is this something that you've kind of led the way on? Where, where are we in, in medical science right now with this? Is it, is it more common than not, or is it something you've, as I said, led the way on? Well, I think that um, uh, I certainly uh, have been a proponent of that. Uh, there, there are, I would say, um, it's an evolving uh, technique. I would say there's not uh, that many pay or plastic surgeons around the world that actually practice what we term the process of breast augmentation or, or what needs to be done in order for patients to have a 24-hour recovery or a fast-track recovery. Um, but uh, it is something that you know multiple surgeons around the world have done and had patients to have been able to realize that that type of recovery but uh, I think it is an important indicator of, of the actual quality of the procedure that's being delivered so I think that it is an important recovery um, is no doubt a good indi indi indicator of that and so uh, for, for the surgeons around the country and around the world that are, are practicing the techniques that allow patients to recover like that, I think it, it, it also translates into other things that we know that patients benefit from, uh, things like less reoperations, uh, less complications, uh, and again, a better overall experience with the procedure. I guess that just makes common sense for laymen out here that you know less is, is more in this case. It's, it's certainly better. You also mentioned liposuction before. Is that what it used to be? I know that there was talk of, of people being laid up for some time and not being able to be active for quite a while after that. Is, has that changed these days? You know, the, uh, the techniques for liposuction definitely have evolved in, in the past 20 years, you know, 20 or 25 years ago, again, liposuction was not really a mainstay uh, plastic surgery procedure. Um, you know, I think there were very few plastic surgeons that actually embraced that as a, a technique, and, and now I would say virtually all plastic surgeons do liposuction commonly, and, you know, the, the, the techniques uh, and the, the technology is, is clearly evolving. I think that has translated into patients being able to, uh, number one, have quicker recoveries from liposuction and, and, and better overall results. So, um, and I think that's, again, an evolving thing. In our hot topic session, um, you know, fat removal, whether it's uh, through surgical means or non-surgical means, is always one of the most common presentations that, uh, that we have. And, and, and liposuction remains, as we talked about, breast augmentation recently has been the number one surgical procedure, but liposuction is always very close behind, is either uh, the second um, uh, or third most common plastic surgical procedure. You just uh, were talking about that hot topics once again. What other types of things do you hear? I mean, there must be a lot of questions out there. And uh, as we say, you've, you've uh, already today during the program shot down some myths. What, what comes up in these types of sessions? 
Yeah, it's there's actually very very well um, uh, received and attended uh, session because as you say, there are um, a lot of myths in plastic surgery, and unfortunately, with the way marketing is and what in the internet, um, a lot of times there's things that that get marketed or um, uh, get hyped before or there's any really scientific validation of whether they're a good thing for patients or safe for patients. And so we see a lot of uh, different technologies come through with the Hot Topics Forum. Uh, I'll mention a couple other ones, but one is, um, you know, there's, there's we were talking about liposuction. Um, there's these laser liposuction technologies, uh, again, that have been marketed very heavily as, you know, the the next best thing in liposuction and body contouring where somebody can just have a little laser fiber placed into their um, whatever fat compartment and the fat can easily be uh, removed with much less recovery and, and better skin tightening. And so that's obviously um, has a big appeal to pay a patient or a potential patient that's looking at a body contouring procedure. We've looked at this in Hot Topics and what we found is that there's really not a lot of scientific data right now to say whether or not this is a, a better or an advancement in, in liposuction. So um, that that's really where the, the buck always kind of stops where uh, the science rests. And so uh, it is really just an evolving topic right now. There is uh, um, very little scientific data to necessarily say that, that that new laser liposuction technology produces any better better result uh, than standard liposuction techniques. And so that's something that we're all looking at um, from the, the scientific perspective to, to determine uh, if, the, if those laser type liposuction technology, technologies will be implemented into to cl common clinical practice. But right now, uh, I would just say basically the jury's still out on, um, on that topic. Is that part of the work that you do when you're at UT Southwestern? Do they intertwine pretty seamlessly or, or how does that shake out for you? Well, you know, my, my uh, research interests have been in, in breast implant technology, breast implant aging, and then uh, patient outcomes in breast augmentation. So that's really where my um, main uh, research has, has been in. Um, but we do have, have several uh, very close colleagues that, that actually are researching the laser liposuction technology uh, that are also at, at Southwestern and other areas of the country. So. Uh, that's not necessarily my own personal research focus, but uh, it is being researched uh, here here in Dallas. We've been, spent the better part of the uh, half hour talking about the uh, physical aspects of this, the medical aspects, if you will. How about the mental procedure? There must be a, a reason why this is so popular. When you talk with patients, do they feel better about themselves, or, or are you helping in that regard as well? Absolutely. You know, if you look at... Uh, different studies that looked at patient outcomes in plastic surgery, the, the number one thing that's seen is that patients have uh, equivocally almost all a, a bump up in their quality of life um, following plastic surgery procedures. So not only are they satisfied with their procedures, but they feel better about themselves. Uh, and that translates positively for them uh, for uh, the rest of the things that they do uh, in their everyday life. So. That's you know it's actually a, a, a great thing um, being a plastic surgeon because it, it's uh, it's it's you know it's fun uh, in the sense that we um, uh, you know it's not it's, it's different from maybe when I was doing trauma surgery and general surgery you're you're truly saving sometimes people's lives due to traumatic events but but in plastic surgery I can tell you we can have some uh, very significant impact positively on people's lives. Uh, with these different procedures that are being done and uh, patients are thankful for it and, and it makes it feel good to be uh, involved with that. The uh, the process leading up to it, I guess uh, people probably give a great deal of thought to this beforehand. Uh, once they do, before they even contact you, uh, then they probably want to, once they decide to, to make the, the change, they want to do that quickly. How does that all proceed through the office and, and what's the timetable on that? Generally speaking, I know every case is, is a little different. Yeah, well, we, we actually, um, it's interesting because patients tend to research things and think about things for even years. And I've seen a lot of patients have thought about a procedure for two or three years and then finally make a decision they want to come in and have the procedure. And usually by the time they decide to do that, 
a lot of people kind of want to have it the next day. Um, so they once they make that decision, it's it's, it's a quick one. But um, patients will call, uh, call or email us. Uh, we you know we're we're easily found on the internet and we're easily reachable by phone. But we uh, the, the process is basically one that we want to um, uh, have both uh, my patient educator meet with the patients, and that's a very productive uh, and well received interaction where she will. Um, talk with patients. She's very knowledgeable, um, very approachable, and patients are able to learn, um, you know, certainly from our practice philosophy about their specific procedure they're interested in. And then at the same time, they're scheduled for a consultation with me where we can meet, discuss uh, the procedure, my recommendations, uh, and any other questions the patient may have. And and we, you know, our our practice certainly is set up to um, make that experience in plastic surgery as positive as it can be for the patient. So we, we actually like to not have patients wait a long time. Uh, we want to get patients in uh, as quickly as possible based on when they want to be seen. And we find that that, um, that really works very well for, for our practice and our patients. Dr. Adams, we've taken the questions from the web. I've asked a few questions as well. Anything we haven't touched on today that you wanted to point out? Are there any areas uh, where there are still questions? Well, you know, I, I, not specifically. I think that um, uh, I think that the the only thing that I would um, any patients that are listening out there or um, are considering a plastic surgery procedure, the one thing that I would uh, leave people with is that it's really important to do your homework. Um, if you're going to consider a plastic surgery procedure, you really want to look up and make sure that whoever you're going to consult with is board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Um, it can be very confusing about different people uh, with different levels of training that, that profess to, to perform cosmetic surgery. Um, but um, it's only true plastic surgeons that are board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery that have gone through the accredited uh, extensive training programs, extensive examinations to be uh, board certified. And, and that really translates into um, your well-being as a patient and, and ultimately uh, giving you the best outcome you can be. So I think that, that that's really, I think, a really important thing for potential patients considering plastic surgery. Dr. Adams, you've been great with your time. I know you're busy. I appreciate the visit here with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Michael. Great to be with you. And for those watching on MedicalTVChannel.com, if we didn't get to your questions via the chat room or the email, just notice at the bottom of that page there's a, a section where you can contact the doctor. You can contact Dr. William P. Adams directly if you have further questions, concerns, and whatnot. Send them there, and he'll answer uh, you via email, and perhaps we can move you on down the line. Thanks again for watching MedicalTVChannel.com. I'm Michael Ray.